Hello and welcome back to the Welsh Premiership Podcast and today is episode 24 and we are so excited to be joined by a Premiership legend and a Welsh rugby cult hero, um, a, a legend at Pontypridd and now becoming a little bit of a legend with Merthyr RFC as well. Uh, it's Dale the Chief Macintosh. Dale, how are you? Great, thank you very much. Yeah, great. Okay, so first of all, uh, how did you end up moving to Wales to play rugby? Uh, um, my brother came over previously, right, it started with Gunn Jenkins, the Welsh hooker, and Kerry Jones, the uh, Welsh A at the time, um, centre, both played for Point of Free. They came over and played played with um, myself and my brother in New Zealand. Um, I think I was quite 16 at the time, we were playing senior rugby. And, uh, and yeah, so they've done a season. Uh, just so happened that um, I kind of finished working a kind of uh, job, a, a situation that I had a redundancy. And I decided to, to come over to Wales and experience Wales uh, using that, that redundancy a- and to play a bit of rugby. But it was never my intention to come over and play serious rugby. I just wanted to come over, experience Welsh culture. Welsh, Welsh rugby and uh, yeah, and get on the pop. Yeah, and how different or similar is the rugby culture over here to what is in New Zealand? Um, if you go to the lower levels, um, it's very, very similar. You know, people love the game. It's a community game, huge. Um, you know, very family orientated. When you go to games, you know, you're normally there. You've got or your family with you. Um, if you look at the junior sections and all that, they're all having picnics every year, here and there. You know, it's quite um, quite remarkable when I when I kind of experience it now. But um, yeah, it's very very similar, uh, as I say, just hugely, uh, hugely community based. As you go up the grades, um, I think um, you've got a tendency to isolate yourself in Wales from. From the rest of rest of the rugby, uh, I, I think we kind of uh, tend to have a duty to ourselves and our team uh, and our affiliation with that environment, um, and it kind of uh, sucks you sucks you up. Um, whereas in New Zealand, you know, if you play for Waikato or the Chiefs, um, you're always interacting with with the public. You're you're always trying to kind of um, you know, share share your experiences and and everything uh, because rugby's such a culture and a and a religion out there. And you know, I just found that that a bit different. That we were eating in, in different rooms. You know what I mean? After the games, um, there was no speeches and all that after the games. And even at even in in in, in community rugby, you know. There'd always be big speeches. We'd eat in the same place uh, as as everyone else. Um, people were welcome to have food with us. Yeah, it was it was, it was a touch different, but there's no doubt the comparison was how passionate and, and the, the, the the game was in both Wales and New Zealand. And I know um, a lot of people know you as the chief. Can you explain to us a little bit about how that nickname came about and how that stuck? Yeah, mate. I, uh, I I always tell everyone this. I like I like I tell everyone that it's because my great great grandfather was a Maori chief. But <laughs> the fact of the matter is, a guy Dicky Owen and under the Bull Rugby Club seen me, and he said, "That's the chief of one through over the cuckoo's nest." And I thought, <laughs> I, I just never lived it down, you know. And when you do look at him, fair play, I, I laughed. I, I didn't even I hadn't even seen the film, and I kind of seen a picture or a photo of of this chief, whatever his name is, far out. I, I just burst out laughing. So, yeah, it just stuck, you know. Uh, no qualms. Uh, I've been called worse. <laughs> and obviously you had a long and successful spell at Ponty. Uh, what makes Ponty such a special club? Uh, just, um, again, just how community-driven it is. Um, you know, um, when I say about, and, and again, I'm reminded of New Zealand, I say, you just share everything in Pontypridd, be it in Pontypridd, because 
Uh, we're a funny old animal in Bon and Breathe. We, 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 you know, we, we love each other's company. We play for each other. We die for each other. We do this, we do that. And, 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 and that's great. If you're an outsider, it's tough to get in, you know, and, uh, and we can be one-eyed, you know, myself as a player, uh, the supporters. Um, but in general, I just loved it because of that reason, probably because uh, uh, they were so, so embracing to me, first and foremost, and my family. Uh, my mum loves it, you know, my mum loves Wales in New Zealand. That's all she ever does is walk around in Welsh, Welsh t-shirts, pond t-shirts and, and what have you and, and, and supports and knows exactly, you know, she doesn't know who won if, if Merth is playing, but she bloody knows whether, whether Ponty's won or lost there to this day. Um, so that's just, you know, because we're embraced and, uh, and you know, again, just such a family atmosphere, such a, such a community environment. And uh, it is quite, uh, you know, it, it's quite astonishing how, how, how it was similar to, to New Zealand, as I said earlier. Yeah, and what are some of your favourite memories from your time at Pont de Brive? Oh, shivers, mate. Uh, God. <sighs> a lot of great, great, great memories, you know, throughout the years. Um, you know, I, I remember when Neil Jenkins had his first cap. Uh, it was huge, you know, because he was this little young ginger boy that just come in, you know, a year younger than myself and we're both youngsters together through the environment and Paul John and and we're pretty pretty tight although um, I did hang out with the older guys a lot too because of my drinking habits uh, Jeff and Paul they would, they would uh, you know the, the the party of that the party person I was so that was just just me being a Kiwi being being a Maori I enjoyed the social part of things, but uh, uh, Johnsy and Jinx were pretty more on track, you know. I'm not saying them, they didn't drink, because when they drank, they had a good one, but uh, they knew what they wanted out of life, you know, and uh, and I knew the the sacrifices that Neil had made uh, so earlier on, uh, and so when he got it, you know, I was absolutely over the moon. Um, also, you know, the, the, the leagues and the cups, we won as players, you know, phenomenal. With the parties after, you know, uh, with our families, and and you come back from even losing. I think we lost to Swansea the first year, and we come back and think, oh man, we've let everyone down, and you know, uh, well, well, we go back to the club, duck in the corner, sit in the corner, and just have a quiet couple of beers, you know. God, when we got back. There was just hordes and hordes and hordes of people. You couldn't get near that club. They just hadn't made a, uh, you know, um, a line down towards town. So it took us an age to get through the crowd and and just chance, you know. And that was after we lost, you know. So that's a huge memory for me because it's all well and good winning. It's all well and well and good having success. But we, you know, we were bleeding as people. We we were gutted that we had lost that game and. We put every effort in to win the game, but we played a bloody good Swansea side on the day who just outplayed us, you know, at, 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 at clinical times and clinical moments. Um, so, yeah, we just kind of got back to that club and we got absolutely bollocks. I don't think the bar shut all night. Uh, there was still about 150, 200 people there the next next day, 11 o'clock. Um, so, yeah, just... You know, memories like that. Few incidences that I can't. You know, that we've had off the pitches that 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 I'm not proud of. But when I look back, make make me laugh. You know, uh, one being we got into a bit of a uh, bit of a skidduff, skiduffle in in France, as as normal. Just the one. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and in Colombia is this time. Uh, we like to change it about, you know, we don't want to go to the same place and have a scrap. Uh, and um, so as we do, obviously all over, spent the night in the, in the cells and this and that, and then uh, got caught into the, uh, up into the boardroom on the Monday morning with Kenneth Thomas. Uh, there was about six of us sat in there so the, he went off on one, bang, 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 and then he said, one thing that's good out of this, 
chief, you haven't started it. So I thought, oh, crikey, okay. So I finally, finally kind of calmed down a touch. So he went to work, walk out. Then he just turned around and said, and which one are you standing called an effing dog? And what <laughs> happened during it, one of the police Alsatians jumped on Savin Kronk and he actually choked it out. And I was like, I remember seeing the dog on the floor. Like, <laughs> and I said, what's going on here? Well, you know, at the time, you're just more concerned about not being arrested, obviously defending yourself and all that. But then afterwards, I thought, what enabled him to strangle a poor dog? You know, what had that dog done? But, you know, just funny things like that when you think back and, and on numerous occasions, all my mates, Baz and Stella, they remind me of the crazy things we did. And, and ah, it's just... It was just, you know, just great memories. It was such a great, great time. Yeah, obviously you mentioned then some, some of the instances you got into. Do you regret any of those instances or do you think that they kind of shaped you into the man you are today? Uh, both, you know, if I'm to be honest with you. Um, I, regret, I regret, you know, you know, the brief stuff and all that um, um, because it was just a... a it kind of hindered my 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 international career. Uh, although you know, factually, uh, at one stage I just wasn't playing well enough to, to, to get in the team, and, and that's 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 life. Uh, but at one stage I was, and I kind of carried it over over me a bit. Um, so there there is regret in relation to that. But we actually didn't start it. You know, uh, we did not start it whatsoever. Uh, they initiated everything, you know, to the point, you know, they wanted to continue it and, and we just finished it, you know, even to the point, you know, they come to our hotel with baseball bats and in a minibus, you know, and, and, and this is fact, you know, I don't have to lie about it, there's nothing. Um, and they still wanted to go, but then when we were still all there drinking in the hotel, they changed their mind and got back in the van. So, you know, um, it was tough. And if you see it on the pitch, again, they initiated it all on the pitch. We just weren't going to take a back, backward step because it was part of winning a game of rugby in those days. You know, showing a, any kind of weakness uh, emotionally, morally, uh, physically, you are going to come second in that match, you know, a bit different nowadays. Uh, you know, the high skill level and they're trying to cut out the physicality of the game uh, for safety reasons, obviously. Um, so it, it, is a, it is a bit different, but in those days, you, you, you won games on emotion, you won games on physicality, and, uh, and they thought they could, and they couldn't. So it's our similar regard. And then when you look back at your playing career, who are the best players you played alongside and against? Oh, she was. There's so many, you know, and, and I mean this sincerely. I'm not trying to, trying to be clever here, but, oh, God, you know. You've got the, yeah, obviously Neil Jenkins is is pro prolific and and, and Pont de Prix, uh, not as a kicker, as an absolute legend rugby player. It's, it's, it's speed of pass, his accuracy of pass, is the brain on the man. God, it's unbelievable as far as rugby is concerned. Um, and he was so young when he was teaching elder statesmen. That's 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 the funny part about it. It's, is is he was just a kid himself. Yet, when he said something to Phil John or Steel Lewis, they would stand up and listen. So he probably would be the talisman in relation to the best I've played because he's he done it all, you know. Uh, you know, he really did. Um, he was a people's person, everything. Um, I played with some, you know, Martin Williams, obviously went on and done great things. Um, Phil John, just tough as they come. Couldn't show to save his life, um, but uh, man, he was tough and he didn't take a backward step for no one. And just a great motivator, you know, great talker. Steel Lewis, just absolutely clean off it. Uh, you know, probably should have been in a loony bin uh, because, man, he was a crazy, crazy guy. Um, but he was just so hardened and so respected on the circuit. Um, and then you got... You know, I'm leaving a lot of people. I'm leaving a lot of people out here, but these are these are guys. These are talisman in my younger days. Uh, you know, and then 
you've got your Gareth White, your Kevin Morgans, you know. Uh, but I mentioned, you know, all those guys, but there's two guys that I loved as rugby players and people, and that was Nigel Benzani and, and Neil Lynan, because they're both loose head props, they're both in competition, and they bounced off each other. And the problem you had was you'd be in the middle of it, you know, they would, they'd be there just taking absolute piss out of you, right? And you had to just suffer it, you know. You could smack them in the head or what have you, but it just wasn't worth it. And uh, they were they were so funny and, and characters. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Um, in relation to the people I've played against, I always look at my position, obviously, um, because that's who you're testing yourself again against, sorry, uh, and I was very, very fortunately fortunate to play against or in a, be in an era of some, some great number eights, you know, um, outstanding number eights. You've got Hemi Taylor, okay, great friend, um, but just a skilled, uh, clever rugby player. Uh, Scooby, Mark Jones, hard, you know, you knew what you were going to get out of him, okay, so, you know, you, got, you had to go hard at him, uh, but I think Stuart Davis, and I've said this before, uh, Stuart Davis was probably the best all-around player I've played, uh, and I admired him. There, there was a lot. There was a lot to do with it. Uh, he wasn't only just a good rugby player, but I held him in such high esteem as a person. He was a gentleman. He wasn't on the pitch. He was a great rugby player, and he was hard and on a rugby pitch. Just off the pitch, he carried himself as a gentleman. He was always he always had time to say hello, to have a beer with you. And, and talk and be interested in, in you, you know, and not talk about himself, uh, which us number eights uh, and rugby players have got a tendency to do, you know. And he was always talking. And when you talked with Stuart, when you were in Stuart's company, I really felt um, he wanted to hear what you had to say, which was always comforting. So, yeah, uh, I hold him up a very, uh, very high in, in, in esteem. Yeah, and you won two Welsh Cups in your playing days. What did it mean to you to be able to represent your adopted country? Uh, well, outstanding, you know. Um, you, you start out as a kid wanting to play for your country. Obviously, my country was New Zealand. Okay, you then come to Wales at the age of 18. Um, and... Throughout that time, you're playing and you're playing some good stuff and you know you're as good as the person playing for Wales, but rightfully so, you're not Welsh. <laughs> then people talk and this, this and this, then I, you, 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 you put your effort in with, with your club, so I was Ponte, and then I had my family and then, you know, I wanted to kind of achieve for Ponte Then I wanted to achieve for my family, you know, so, so that... The reasons for wanting to achieve changed. Um, so when I actually got my cap, I had two kids and I was, you know, I was playing for them and and I'd also served, what was it, um, something like eight years because I played an a, I played a couple of A games for Scotland. Um, and you know what? Fair enough. Um, I don't know what the years are now. Is it four years now? You know, if it's four years, great, that's the rule. But I also played with a lot of patriots, you know, a lot of uh, patriotic people. Um, Miffin Davis, well, uh, Welsh hooker, legend. But uh, he's a cottage burner, mate, you know, and he'd bring me home because he didn't drink. So he'd bring me home when we were at two o'clock in the morning. And I'd, I'd make sure he'd drop me off down the street I made sure he didn't know where I lived just in case, you know, because I'd been kept then and I knew he didn't agree with me being kept. So I thought, oh, bollocks to this. He can drop me down the, down the street. But, yeah, so what I'm trying to say, mate, is um, is I understand people that don't feel that I should have played for Wales, you know, because I've got Welsh blood running through my, through my veins. But I've got Welsh kids. I'm married to a Welsh girl. I've been here, good grief, three decades now, you know, uh, so I was never going to go away. It wasn't as if I came over, made my money, had a couple of caps, and up, I'm, I'm off back to New Zealand to live my life. I knew I had set up camp here. I knew there was me. My family was here. My life was there. And 
God willing, I'll be buried here, you know. And, and, and so for me, I thought it was appropriate that, that, that I earned the cap first. And I was so proud when I actually, you know, played. Yeah, and then moving on then to the, to the end of your career and you took your first steps into coaching with Ponte then in another successful period for the club. What are your favourite memories of coaching with Ponte? Um, right, first and foremost, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a progression because um, one of the coaches has stepped down. So luckily, I was able to step in there um, alongside Paul John. Um, my first impressions of coaching was joy because I knew the environment, you know, I knew exactly what I was dealing with. I knew the, the weight on my shoulders. I knew our strengths and our weaknesses, our, our strengths being our, our supporters and our community and, and, the, and, and the badge and the passion for the jersey. Uh, our weaknesses probably being we were kind of under under pressure financially at the time. Um, we had put all our eggs into the Celtic Warriors basket that that just broke us. Uh, so it was, a, and, and the other thing was rebuilding in relation to the level of rugby we now found ourselves because we were always used to being at the top, you know. Our, our supporters trip away, it's changed from Paris to Flandavri, you know, every, you know, so that was just life. And we had to kind of embrace that. We had to kind of, we had to uh, channel that to be successful. But I also knew I wasn't dull. Right? I, I, I was very fortunate to be in a good, good job because I was, I was with the Blues Academy at the time. I had been in rugby development for a long time. So I knew all the players that were 17, 18, 19. I knew the players that were um, established but just weren't quite good enough to, to play regional rugby. So I used that to obviously uh, to, to build Ponty. And, um, and and I also knew that we had an immediate, immediate spinal cord, uh, nucleus of, of a team that was going to compete anyway. It was just about fine-tuning things. You know? Yeah, and you also had a spell coaching the Cardiff Blues. Uh, how do you feel that went? And are there any standout memories from your time there? Um, look, it went how it went. You know, uh, it was tough um, because I felt uh, that my first year when I went in as a defence coach, that full full Davis was put under pressure uh, unnecessarily. Mind, um, we had a horrific, and I mean. Horrific injury season, ridden season on us now. You wouldn't believe, you know, I had to go and get Dicko, uh, Adam Thomas, um, Walshy, uh, who else? Uh, because of that reason, you know, because we were struggling. Uh, and that's no, not, not being detrimental to, to those players, but we had to delve down into, our, into, into the premiership to bring them in. Um, so it was tough. Um, could have done things better without a doubt. And then full, obviously full left, which meant Paul and I were um, head coaches, interim coaches. And that actually went pretty well, you know. And under, under the laws last year, when the, when the Italian sides had to qualify, and under this year's laws, we would have made Europe comfortably. It just so happened that it was the automatic um, Italian size going in automatically. So we actually finished, I think it was fifth or sixth, and that was a that was a bottom of the, the, the qualifying. So we were ousted for two clubs that had finished below us. But you know, again, that was life. Um, enjoyment wise, I thoroughly enjoyed it. The boys were outstanding, the boys were like, you know, digging in deep. I knew that every week in and week out. Uh, we had to manage up. Obviously, because it's the blues, uh, um, and any any business or any top side, you've got to manage up because obviously they're run by by people who who have invested in, 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 into them. So, yeah, that was that was um, that was tough <laughs> with one or two of them, but others were pretty good. Peter Thomas was outstanding, good as gold. 
I've got to say it. Uh, but others were not, simple as that. Um, so, yeah, but I learned a lot. I also learned that it was a facade that Cardiff people are horrible because uh, they're not. I got to say it. I, I had a, a lot of friends down there. I still have great friends. Uh, when I was in Ponte, this is what I'm talking about our environment. We get sucked into an environment. They kind of made me not like Cardiff people. You know what I mean? Because, oh, you play for Ponte. The first thing is you don't like those buggers down the road. Oh, I get it. Not a problem. So I don't like them. <laughs> Then when I kind of went to the blues, I realized, well, I do buddy like them, you know? And I'm like, you buggers, you've told me a fib here. <laughs> and so that's one great thing. I I I I got a lot I I, I taught myself a lot of respect for, for for the card of people. And I I gotta say it, I thought they were great to supporters. You know, a lot of a lot of the people down there, they were they were great to me. So my experience in June was was a tremendous one. And I learned a lot coaching as well. From, from Mark Hammett, who people think that I didn't get on with. I thought he was a tremendous coach, phenomenal coach, great philosophy. Um, if I had an issue, I think he kind of, um, he didn't respect the senior players as, as much as I, 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 I think he should have. Uh, but as, as a coach, as a person, as a philosopher, he was, he was outstanding. Yeah, and more recently, you spent the last World Cup as Phil Davis's assistant with Namibia. How did you find an international environment like that? Oof. Now, this is coaching, boys. I'm telling you now. <laughs> you know, you're coaching five o'clock in the morning. You know, it's uh, it's different because they got to go to work. And then you're coaching at seven o'clock at night because they've just finished work. And then you're meeting them in the gym at 12 o'clock because they're on their lunch break. Uh knowing full well we're about to play the All Blacks. So, um, yeah, it, it was tricky to say the least. Um, the biggest issue was politics. Unbelievable. Okay. Uh, you think we got politics over here, mate, it's nothing. You know, so uh, that kind of upset me a bit. Um, but um, what uh, an absolute privilege to coach um, such lovely people and I, and I mean this sincerely they're very religious and they're very respectful of life and grateful of life and, and anything and and it's thank you sir thank you and I kept trying bro I'm not a sir I'm not sir I'm not clever enough to be sir I'm not a, I never went to bloody school to be sir uh, just call me chief man oh, okay Mr. Chief oh, I was like oh but you know, uh, they, 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 they used to pray before the game, you know, and, uh, oh, sorry, they used to sit, they used to collectively pray after the game. So you'd see them all in a huddle on their knee. And uh, I'm at the back kind of bobbing up and down because I don't know whether to get on my knee or not get on my knee. I just had a hip, a new hip, a hip replacement. So I was in bloody bits. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, so that's how religious they were. And then we went to the, the ground uh, where they had a tsunami, where it got cancelled, actually. Um, and the first thing they done is get off the bus, walk in the middle of the pitch, or, or got down and said a prayer for those that, you know, had lost their lives. So it, it was just an, a, a, a great occasion. I did say to them, mind, uh, before the All Blacks game, I said, I think it might be an idea to pray before the game and not after it. <laughs> but uh, I don't think they thought that was that funny. <laughs> there we are. But we oh, had a great showing of ourselves. Uh, the boys worked unbelievably hard for, for who they were as amateur rugby players. Even right through, they were arguing over, you know, one, two, three thousand pounds uh, because that's what they were getting to go to the World Cup, yet they still weren't going to get it. So it was tricky, but it was uh, it was so emotional and uh, and I'm thankful for the experience. And yeah, as Tobias mentioned, you got to work with Phil Davis again with Namibia. How good of a coach is Phil and how good of a bloke is he as well? Uh, Phil's a superb coach, okay, but he's an absolute magician uh, with man management, he, he he just knows how to deal with people, mate. You know, because uh, I'm not the easiest person to deal with. You know, 
Uh, I didn't get on the sherbet out there, but when I did, if I did, you know, and in the past, he's he's been always been great, but he just again very similar to to, to Stuart Davis. What I said, uh, he, he's got a lot of dignity, a lot of integrity, and, and and he holds himself well. You know, he he does lose his temper, and I and, and we sniggle at each other because we are great friends. We we look at each other and start sniggling to each other because we know he's lost it. And but but it's not regular. But when he does, oof, he does. Um, but he had to put up with a lot. And um, I, I'll be blatantly honest with you, I learned a hell of a lot from him, you know, uh, with Namibia. Um, Coaching-wise, no, because we were restricted in how much we could coach because of their ability uh, and the time we had with them. We couldn't reinvent the wheel, you know. We had to just kind of tart things up and, and dot the I's and cross the T's. But just managing people um, and racism, uh, racial, uh, you know, it, it was high on their list both ways. So if you can imagine a black person being racist towards a white person, and that was very, very common. And I'd be like, I've never seen that before, you know, and... and um, so I just learned a lot about probably myself and Phil allowed me because he did say to me, he said, mate, you're going you're gonna to have an experience here. I don't know whether it will actually be on the pitch. But uh, as I say, uh, I come back a, a different person and hopefully, although if you ask my wife, she's probably saying what a load of bollocks. Uh, but uh, yeah, I did, I did enjoy it and I appreciate it. Yeah, so obviously you're coaching Merthyr now. Uh, how are you enjoying your time there? Oh, superb. Um, tough one because I went in to help my mate, uh, Lee Jarvis, at the time. Um, you know, Merthyr's, Merthyr's tradition is second, third division rugby. That, that's, that's where they've been all their lives. Um, we've been fortunate in Pontypri that we've actually been able to pinch their best players. Uh, so it's worked for us. But uh, Sir Stan Thomas decided he wanted to invest in the town. And the best way to invest in the town was to invest in the rugby club so he could give, give young kids uh, facilities, opportunities, and just something to strive towards, you know? Now, as I said, our badge represents second, third division. So to get to a level of competition, Sir Stan had to pay money. You know, so we worked with a budget, very big budget in the first couple of years, second division, and then our first year in the, in, in the Prem. Uh, but then we cut that by about 40% uh, because it wasn't right. Um, we initially, or, or Sir Stan had initially, um, as I said, I put the money in for the right reasons, but we were starting to get to a level of rugby and a little level of continuity in rugby that... I wanted them to kind of be proud of the jersey as a player and the environment and say, look, uh, it's got a mercy, not, not for the money, but made us good crack up there, you know. Uh, Chief Dacey, they're bang, bang, bang. They're good coaches and and and, and they love their rugby and they, they they play to a style that we want to play. And that's what I wanted to, to do, you know. Um, so it worked out pretty well. We were quite consistent in what we did. Um what I think the important thing for me was in Mercer that I had to use Sir Stan's money wisely. So we in other clubs, and I've seen this in every club I've been to, Ponte included, you'd pay your marquee player, let's say hypothetically, 20 grand. Then that kid in the corner is on 700 pound, you know, now, that kid in the corner puts the same effort as that guy there. And throughout the season, he's going to have to take their pitch, and you're going to be dependent on that guy down there. And um, if he hasn't got the same motivation, the same application as that big marquee player, then he's just not going to be good enough. So what we did is we took that marquee player's wages down and we filtered it quite even, the monetary is quite evenly across. So there wasn't a big gap between our marquee player and our third string prop, let's say. 
because we knew we were going to be dependent on that. And, and that's what worked for us, um, spending that money wisely, promoting a, a great environment, um, being passionate about the jersey, being passionate about who we are and our ethics, pretty much like Ponty. Well, there we are. Exactly what, what I did in Ponty, exactly what I was in Ponty, what we were in Ponty. I took to Mercer, except I had a couple of bob <laughs> alongside it. So we had a few, few beers after the game free. Well, what are some of your favourite memories from being with the club so far? With Mercer? Yeah. Oh, obviously just winning the leagues, you know. Um, it's pretty simple to win, winning the league in the cup because it paid it paid respect to those that had put in. Not not me, mate. Uh, I, I was nothing. I, I was fortunate enough to get paid relatively well for it. Uh, I'm passionate about rugby anyway. I'm passionate about people anyway. So I was going to do it anyway, but it was just in a Mercer jersey. Also, Mercer is a big boxing and, and football town, um, and they still are. We weren't there to try and move them aside. We were there to be part of that fabric, to be part of those celebrations and, and wanting them to be part of it with us. So, so young kids up there have got op options, you know, where they want to be a stripper, you know, if they want to be a footballer, if they want to be a rugby player. God bless them, do what they want, but the facilities are all there and the options are there. Um, so I was more pleased for the town. Um, I was pleased for Sir Stan because it was a, a major investment. Um, I think uh, he found a couple of quid under his mattress somewhere. Um, but um, it's more about, about the players, you know, the players, a lot of those players hadn't won anything. A lot of those players had been in clubs before that were good clubs, but just couldn't quite get over the line. You know, I had players there, obviously, from Ponty, but I never took them to Ponty. Mine, they went to their brother before I joined. Let's get that right. And, um, and they had experienced success. And watching their faces interacting with the guys that hadn't said it all for me. They weren't there, yeah, oh, this is like when we won in such and such. It wasn't there, it was like, mate, what a feeling, oh, bro, feeling, yeah. And it was just, you know, it was magic, magic for the town, magic for those players. And more importantly, it, kind of, it put a bit of worse in the jersey uh, for, 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 that, for that 12, 13, 14 year old that was watching those games. Yeah, and I know you, you touched on it briefly then, but um, sort of away from the team, I know like, the clubhouse has been redone and stuff. How much does it mean for the community of Merthyr to have that sort of hub and that place to go? Yeah, it is. It's huge. Uh, I'll tell you something, right, and I don't know, I haven't even discussed this with the players, but we, our club was sold. So all last year, we had to eat and, and have our aftermatch um, our food and that in one of the clubs um, up um, up in Mercer, and, and they're great, absolutely phenomenal. Beautiful people, done a great job as well as they could because it was tight in there to say the least, uh, but they were great and, 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 and they, they serviced us as best as they possibly can. But it wasn't ours, it wasn't our club. You know, mate, the amount of people, if I had a pound for every time someone said to me, yeah, Pony Pree's got a shithole, shit hole club, isn't it? Shit hole club. Yeah, it is, but it's, but it's our shithole. You know, it's, it's, it's our club, it's our bricks and mortar. And, and that's my point, you know, is we, 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 we lost that togetherness because we're in a strange place and we, we couldn't have a barbecue, we couldn't have a drink uh, and, and stay on as late as we wanted. You know, um, so I'm not blaming that uh, for our poor season, but it definitely didn't help us, you know, along the way. Uh, although, as I say, the club were, 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 were tremendous. Um, but, yeah, having that new club up there now, looking at it, it looks it looks great. It's very, you know, it's one-tiered, so it's the same as pont It's just a newer version of a, of a pont a set setup, you know, even, even the lounge bars and that, you know. So, and what, what that means is we all mingle together. So we're no longer, because in our old club, mind, we used to eat in the other room and all the supporters were in another room. And I didn't like that. So now 
we can all be in the same room, you know, and that's what it should be about. We're a community club. They're a community club. We play that game for the town and we're successful for the town. So why shouldn't they share it with us every weekend, not just the big games? Exactly like point of period. Well, yeah, that, that leads on to my next question, which is, do you see some similarities between Merthyr and Ponte? Huge. Yeah, huge. Uh, a lot because um, myself and Lee Jarvis probably um, orchestrated it. Um, it, it. They were environments that were successful for us. So we kind of knew how to, how to, uh, how to twing the strings. Um, also... <laughs> Yeah, uh, some of the players are from Pontypri, so they knew um, they knew what would work and what hasn't worked. So you know they're experienced people like Craig Locke and that. So yes, um, the similarities are there because we've put them there, uh, as well as they're a big town. You know, Merth is a huge town. Um, but Ponty's a big area. So although Ponty's got a bigger catchment area and stronger in general, because they we take from Ashton on the Triorki, and there's a bull, Abercannon, you know, all these Red Vallon, all these very strong community clubs to make Pontypri stronger. We've only got three or four in Mercer. Uh, so we haven't got that, that capacity as well as the boxing, as well as the football. Um, so we had to make, a, make it a real tight and ruthless environment. Um, so, yeah, and, 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 but they are similar as villages. You know, they're, they're village people. They're proud of where they're from. Uh, when they take the field or, or they compete in anything, they're proud of what they do. So, you know, the answer to your question, hugely uh, similarities, uh, both orchestrated by myself and Lee Jarvis, as well as, just being similar environments, similar similar towns. Yeah, and having been involved in the Premiership for a long time, what do you think the purpose of the league is? Do you think it's to develop the young players coming through or is it all about just winning the league? Development, okay. But people got to ask themselves, what does development look like? Okay, so it's pure development, right? A development doesn't mean you play a 17-year-old in front of a 28-year-old because he's had his time. And it's development is, is, is what does development look like? That's a big question. So you're playing these Mickey Mouse pop and crisp A games, right, for the Blues. Okay, you've got all a bunch of youngsters who are playing experienced people, Leinster A, um, they go out there and they've got all the endeavour in the world. Okay, all the endeavour in the world. They're going to work their cogs off, but they haven't experienced something like this. They don't know how to change up and how to change down. They haven't got the experience. Development, uh, to me, is putting a 17-year-old next to David Lockyer in Pontypridd, okay, who then challenges the best out there in the British and Irish Cup or be it for Mercer or be it against Carmarthen or, or whomever, uh, and they put themselves, but they've got this guy next to them to lean on when you need him, okay? This guy next to him is excited because he gets this young bugger next to him who knows he can rip it up any, any minute. But then when times get tough, their young fella is going to depend on that older fella. And that's development, okay, as well as off the pitch, Okay. As academy players, I've been there, mate. I, 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 I work for the academy. They've been given everything. Doesn't make them bad people. Uh, and it doesn't make them spoiled little brats because they're not, because they're good kids. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in, a, in the academy because we also go on character. But they haven't been pissed up, you know what I mean? They haven't had a good laugh with the boys. They haven't had a barbecue and, 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 and then had a good, you know, just interacted with the supporters and all that. They haven't, and then once you get part of something, then you want to give more back. And so for me, the premiership's about development. It's, it's about bringing these youngsters, okay, whether they're in the academy or they're not, they haven't quite made it at that point, using your environment 
your seniority, your experience as a coach and experienced players to bring this kid through. And then when the time's right, you shake his hand and you wish him all the best when he goes and plays for the region. And that's exactly how it should be. And it should be players. If you're from the Ponte area, you go back to Ponte. If you're from Cardiff, you go to Cardiff. You know, we haven't got a big catchment area, but if they're from Mercer, well, I know we've kind of leaned towards the Aberdeers and the Mountain Ashes as well. Um, then they come back to Mercer. Uh, if we can do it that way, um, I think it's fair. Uh, I also think, you know, I, I use the analogy, I play for the bull when I finished playing for Pointe Breathe, you know, people were going, well, what are you doing, mate? And I played for the Bull Seconds. So they thought I'd just go out there, you know, whatever. That. Well, I didn't. I went out there and I just flew into everything. And they were like, well, what are you doing, man? You know, you're, you're 38 years of age, 40 years of age. Why are you doing that? And I said to them, well, I've got to buy my bread and milk and under the Bull. All right. So what that means is I'm from the Bull. I'm not going to go up to my local co-op buying bread and milk and someone behind me said, Yes, Chief, you were shit yesterday playing for Honours of the Bull. I'm too proud for that. So my point being, if you're from Ponapri, if you've grown up, grown up watching Ponapri, if you know what Ponapri is about, then I promise you something, you're going to fly into it in a Ponapri jersey. If you're not from, 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 uh, from Ponapri and you're from Cardiff, but you've been made to go down there, are you really going to give it everything? When your back's against the wall, are you going to scrap yourself out of it? No, nah, you're not, mate. You're going to say, oh, let's just get, bloody, get, get this game over and done with it, get back down in the region. That's my, you know, that's my theory on it. Um, I think I'm right because it's, it's the nature of the beast. And, uh, and if you don't think that way, then you're probably not a good person or you shouldn't be playing a game at a high level. Yeah, and Dale... I just wanted to touch on, obviously you were around when regional rugby was introduced and the whole thing with the Celtic Warriors it is a hard question to answer, but what are your thoughts on regional rugby and do you feel like it works? Um, it's a tough question for different reasons. Um, I was lucky enough to be part of the Super 6 conversation because at the time I was captain of Pontypri. They were happening about the 2000 mark, uh, the year 2000. So I was party to a lot of those meetings and they were going to be the Super 6 or the Super 8, the top six or top eight clubs. And they were going to get that finance. And obviously you went regional, okay? Uh, what I will say, um, it couldn't stay how it was because it would have been bankruptcy, simple. We never had the money to facilitate all the clubs anymore. We knew that. So the regional concept um, was made. I believe, I still to this day believe it should have been a Super 6. Should have went for the Super 6 clubs that had earned their right to be in there. Uh, you know, straight away, you see Cardiff Blues playing part, playing, uh, playing lip service to the regions. Now all of a sudden, now they've just decided, no, we're going to do our own thing after 10 years or whatever, whatever it is. Um, so as regional rugby were, worked, probably not as well as, I, as, it, as it could have or should have, uh, but the alternative was bankruptcy. And, and it's all well and good saying, well, that car is not very good, or, you know, but the car that we're going to have if we don't fix that one is shite, you know. So it's always versus something. So I know for a fact, you know, it was going to be bankruptcy. Um, but if I can tell you, I don't think regional rugby has worked as well as we it could have or should have for for obvious for, for different reasons. Um, but we never had a lot of choice. And how does the standard of the Premiership compare now to how it was in your playing days? Uh, a tough question because um, the most important person in uh, in the game now is the referee. Um, you know they they're running the show so you've got to bow down to their interpretation of, of, of the laws. Um, so it's very, it's, it's much, you know, I, I think it's it's quicker without a doubt. Um, it's, 
the skill levels are same for different reasons. The skill level it's quicker because and, and, and the speed skills are involved. But back in uh, you know when, when I was playing in the Prem and coach, people were trusted their skill set. They'd they'd be more flamboyant. They'd, they'd try these one hand or flows and all that. You know what I mean? But because you're always under microscope as as, as, as academy players, this this and that. I think people suffocate themselves a bit. You know. Uh, and and it's tough. Even as a coach, you say to them, "Mate, just go and express yourself." Bang, bang, bang. Um, you know, give them enough rope to express themselves, but not enough rope to hang themselves. So, you know, that's the important thing. Um, so, without a doubt, the physicality is nowhere near, uh, and that's because of the laws of the game now and the interpretations of the law. And that's fair enough, by the way. Uh, I got serious issues on 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 a lot of that. But um, but I also understand the health and safety aspect of it. So it's quicker, okay. It's as skilled, um, nowhere near as physical, and yeah, and that's about it. It's still a it's 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 attractive to the average human being. But there's people out there that like the confrontation. They like a they like a bit of a scrap. They like a big hit. They like to smash someone in the ruck. You know. Uh, well, we've lost those. I know a lot of people watch rugby league now because of that reason. But you know, that's just life. You know, that's just trying to get the balance right between between playing the game and making it safe. And let's take you back to last season before the it got cancelled due to COVID. Maybe it was six in the league. What did you make of the season up until that point? Ah, uh, quite bad. Really, you know, we we struggled with consistency. Um, I'll take a. I'll take. I'll take blame for it. Um, you know, I, I I wasn't there for the first half, well, first couple of games, first four or five games actually. Uh, we come unstuck then, and then and then you you're playing catch up. You know, I was, I was in obviously I was in Japan. Um, it was a decision that I couldn't turn down. You know, it was a life changing experience for me. Not life changing, but just a life experience for me. Uh, and I and I really felt I, I was going to bring something back, which I did, you know, back to Mercer. But um, we had, you know, we had injuries in key positions earlier on. Um, like everyone else, I don't want to sit here and make excuses because rugby's about variables, you know, uh, and and we've all had them, you know, ups and downs. So um, it just happened that we we had, you know, we had a few injuries. It just happened that I wasn't there to perhaps orchestrate a few things here and there, and a couple of key positions weren't playing playing as well as they had in the past. And you know what? That's rugby. That's just life. Um, did I foresee it? No, definitely not. Uh, but as I say, you know, it wasn't good, and, and it wasn't. You know, we've set ourselves self targets, and. Sometimes when you win three leagues on a tamp or whatever we won, I don't even know. Um, you try, you start to think you're untouchable. Not me. I, I, I've been there enough to know you can get stung. You know what I mean? Big time. So um, it's just trying to keep people's feet on the floor. But these guys haven't been as successful as this for a long time or ever. So it was always tough. And I'm not saying they got... They got in front of themselves. I'm just saying things happen, you know, and, and it did. So to sum it up, oh, we had a disastrous season. <laughs> disastrous. I mean, uh, I just want to touch on it. It sort of shows how far Merthyr as a club have come from the lower leagues of Welsh rugby to finishing sixth in the Premiership and feeling that's a disastrous season. Um, and then moving on... Um, have you had a chance to get back in with the boys yet? And when are you aiming for for to start the competitive games again? Um, yeah, no, I haven't had a chance to get back in with the boys. I've kept in touch with uh, most of them. Um, but I'm sceptical to keep bringing them because every time I ring them, uh, they're like, oh, we're starting, are we? And I'm like, oh, no, no, we're not. But we're not. You know, so I don't want to kind of uh, send out false hope. But... Um, we haven't we haven't started and we don't want to kind of uh, be responsible for another spike so um we've sat back and just kind of taken the governance of the wru um i think 
in a, realistically, we want to play this season. You know, obviously, the season's over now anyway. But I, I think, hypothetically, it, I'd like to think we could get back playing full rugby in the middle of October, beginning of November. And that then, then, then that'll give us a couple of months still to kind of see where this, this virus lies. And then we can, uh, so then we look at chain to chain arguments like September, October, and then fly into it. And even then, it'd be a managed season for obvious reasons, just in case there's re-spikes. Uh, and this and that. So um, let's just get back with the boys, you know, uh, get back on the payroll kind of thing, you know what I mean? And uh, and just just have a meaning to life at the moment because it's been bloody boring, you know? Um, so, yeah, that, that's that's what I'm hoping. And, yeah, that's the, to, to the original question was, we have come a long way, mate, because, um, because we would have been irresponsible not to because of the investment of Sir Stan Thomas. And Mercer as a town was always a dormant giant. And I knew that in Pontefreeze, mate, when I had the likes playing for me, I was like, All right, this is great, you know what I mean? And then someone said, oh, Sir Stan's investing in Mercer. And I thought, you know what? It's about time. I, I, this, is, this has happened about 10 years too late, but, but it is what it is, guys, you know? Yeah, and then the final question from myself is, what are Merthyr's like uh, aims for next season, and how good have Merthyr been at keeping the, like the players busy during during COVID and not being able to train? Yeah, we can only depend on on the players' um, honesty, I suppose. Uh, they've got to be self-propelling as well. Um, so you know, we've sent out programs, training programs, bang, but. We don't know. We didn't know when 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 this when when, when the end was coming of this of this pandemic. So um, at this time and moment, um, I know a couple of the boys have put a bit of beef on, so they got a bit of work to do. Um, again, managerially, we can't just bring them in, bring them in, and smash them because they're going to break down on us. You know, these guys haven't played rugby for God knows. Um, for for a year, they haven't, you know, they haven't made contact for a year, so we can't just kill them off in the first four weeks. So we've got to manage that as well. You know, we're going to have to spread that that, that preseason out and be very very uh, smart smart with that. Um, as far as have we kept the players? Um, we don't know our budget yet. Is the honest truth? And we don't know our budget because there's a lot of conversations going on with the WRU and the Premiership in relation to finances. So until we um, we know our finances, then you know we can't say I can't say that I'm going to keep him, him, and him. Um, but genuinely, I think everyone's under, understands the situation. It's not our fault. It's not your fault. It's not my fault. Um, it's just probably humanity's fault that this has happened and we just got to all try and deal with it together. So we're doing that at the moment. Um, I'm really, really hopeful that we'll know a lot more in the next fortnight because I know there's very important meetings going on in the next fortnight. Once that takes place, we can all sit down both collectively as a premiership and discuss the way forward and then individually as your clubs. And discuss your way forward, and, and 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 then that's when your targets will be set, you know, and your KPIs will be set. So, um, you know, but I'm hoping if you're asking me sitting here, you know, I'm going to play this league this year to win the league. You know, that's all I've ever done. That's all I've ever known. Whether we do that, obviously, is another thing. Whether we're able to do it, whether they give us an actual competition to play in, again, I don't know. But if they give us a competition. If I get some some sort of budget, whatever it is, I'll fly into it, mate. Yeah, and then lastly then, um, how did COVID affect you personally and what were you doing to keep yourself busy during all the lockdowns? Um, well, being lucky enough to be on furlough, 
Um, and not a lot, to be honest with you, bro. Just training, um, you know, got to a gym because I, 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 I had, I was able to get to a gym. Can't tell you what gym it is, Wayne. Um, uh, all, all through the governance, I didn't, I, no one else used it. So, uh, so yeah, just trained, trained hard, tried to stay level-headed, uh, tried to keep positive, um, Try to keep the family positive, although my son's in that work from home. Um, my wife works for the for the NHS. Um, you know, and it's just about that, just trying to stay positive. And, 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 uh, and I, I'll be honest with you, the last month has been the toughest. You know, when you're on that finishing street and you know you're almost over that finish line, you start getting anxious. And uh, and that's been tough. I laid off the booze, you know. I, 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 I leave right off the booze. I mean, I drank twice in in six six months, seven months, which is a miracle for me. But um, um, yeah, it's just been about staying focused, trying to keep your weight down because you know you get those those lockdown love handles. We've all seen them, boys and girls. So um, yeah, uh, but I, I'm not going to lie. It's been tough times, you know, because. Uh, when you play, when you play sport all your life, when you've played a team sport all your life, you're used to being around people. And in the last five months, we simply haven't. And uh, and it's, it is a new experience. It's it's an experience I wouldn't want to 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 do uh, nor uh, on, on a regular basis. Uh, and yeah, I just miss, I've missed people, you know. So God help them when I get out there now in the gym, man, I'll be talking them to death. And to finish, we've got a teammates quiz for you. Oh, so sure. firstly, of all the players you played with or coached, who's the worst dressed? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's going to be, a you boys might know him, Martin Rollins, flanker from Landwood Vardra. Horrific. He used to wear green. Green was his favourite colour. Green and white striped trousers, green shirt, and green like um, boat shoes with massive green suction things on. That was his favourite. But how we didn't have a hiding for wearing that, I don't know. But mm-hmm. I know I wanted to slap him just for wearing those shoes. But there we are. Martin Rollins, without a doubt. And uh, apart from yourself, who's the best drinker? <laughs> um... Oh, shivers. That's a, that's a tough one. Um, who's a bit of a... I know Lockyer would want, to, want me to tell him, but he's not even in, he's not even in the first 15. Um, <laughs> steady drinker, good drinker, full John. And uh, who's the best changing room DJ you've seen? Oh, shivers. Uh, you know what? I don't know who was doing the music because I used to absolutely hate music. But <laughs> it, it, I know it's between Tubbs and Dicko. Uh, and Jake Thomas is pretty good as well. In our day, mate, well, we would have a bit of Elvis on in the background, you know what I mean? And uh, and get on with it and, 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 a, and a cream roll and get out there. But nowadays, like, music's important to them, you know? So, yeah, I think Jakey, Jake Thomas, Tubbs and... Yeah, Dicko thinks he's been in Venus flytrap too. <laughs> and now, who's the biggest liability you've seen on a night out? <laughs> uh, besides me again? <laughs> <laughs> um, Lockyer's pretty good, right? Lockyer, <laughs> Lockyer takes on some handling. Uh, Aaron Pinches. Aaron Pinches is a bit warm on, on a night out, you know. And a... And a well, in a tricky way, I'm not going to lie here. Um, Kerry Sweeney. Once his head starts doing that, right? Then look out, guys. Anything can happen, boys, all right? Yeah, once old Noddy goes, anything can happen. So, yeah, I'm going to go with Kerry Sweeney. And if you were stuck on a desert island, who's the teammate you'd most want to be with and the one you'd least like to be with? Neil Linen, most, because he's just hilarious. And he'd... He'd, he'd, he'd give me a survival kit in that in his humour. 
the least wow well, well, this is a tricky one probably Stella because he just want to fight me all the time <laughs> he just loves to fight, lives fighting and he and he always he always picks up picks on me he just don't don't like me when he's got a few beers in him he just wants to kill me all the time and he just can't that's all <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a wrap for episode 24 then. Cheers for coming on, Dale. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks for taking your time now. Cheers. And for those of you watching, remember to follow us on social media at Last Pod. And we'll see you again in two weeks for the next episode. Thank you and goodbye.